This song, Bob? Yes. No. Yes. I can. No, we're not out. We are November? Yes. Do you have the bag? We'll get that after service. We need to count the eight points. I'll count. And technically, then. My turn. You did last time. I'll do this time. Okay. Wow. If one of you guys just, you know, like create a guitar, you can keep tuning, that would be just fun. I appreciate that. Hey, I want to welcome you to the vineyard this morning. Uh, we are here to worship the Lord. Where's the songs are going to be on the screen behind us. And we sincerely hope and pray that uh, you will invite the Lord, you know, to, to come in this worship. That you will engage with him in this worship. I believe the Lord is already here. Amen. And sometimes we just need to have just some of the other garbage just kind of scraped off so that we can see him, so we can be aware. And I don't think there's anybody here who doesn't want to be touched by the Lord today. Amen? Amen. So let's, let's, uh, let's draw near. Let's set our, our focus in on the person of the Lord. Jesus, we love you so much. We welcome you into this place. Holy Spirit, come now and have your way. Again, I ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, you would remove every hindrance that would keep us from drawing close to you. Lord, we love you more than anything. Your kingdom come, Lord, and your sovereign will be done here. In Jesus' name, amen. You can stand if you'd like. We'll start a little slow.
stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the Lamb who was slain on that day Heal the sick, God. Encourage the brokenhearted, Lord. God, let your kingdom come, Lord, as your presence now falls upon us. And let your will be done, Lord, among us. Father God, in this moment, as we stand in your presence, we realize, Lord, just perhaps a mere glimpse of the glory that is yet to come. Oh, Father, thank you for this moment with you. Thank you for your presence. Lord. We love you so much. We bless you, and we give you praise, glory, and honor in this house today. 
In Jesus' name, church, we pray. Amen. Would you praise the Lord? Good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? <laughs> Little frost. <laughs> well, at this time, it's time to dismiss the children, ages three years through the eighth grade, back to their classrooms. See you guys in a little bit. And as they are making their way out, here are your announcements. First, if you feel led to give an offering as an extended uh, version of your worship, of course. You uh, can place things in the gray boxes at the exits located by the doors. You can go to our website uh, using your smartphone for, with our app. Uh, and, but with that being said, if you are our guest today, uh, even online, please, of course, don't feel the need to give financially. We're glad that you are our guest. And a reminder, and I brought the reminder, it's our, the, our coffee house is now open. So if you would, yes, applause, applause. If you would like to be among those who drink coffee in the sanctuary, we ask that you pick up a spill-proof mug from the coffee house, as I am holding right here. And, uh, and I want to give this one away, though. Uh, uh, we do ask for a small donation, but I've made a donation in order to give this one away. Um, does anybody actually want this one? Hey, all right. Michael gets it. Hand went up first. And while I uh, am delivering this one to Michael, uh, our administrator, Lori Tatman, has an announcement. I get the mic. Woo. Thank you, Jim. So if you've ever wondered what it's like to have a beautiful moment with God and then run off to teach Sunday school, this is it. Total different scenario here. Um, I handed out homework. A lot of you got this on the way in. This is just one of the lessons we do in our classes. We are going to do a patchwork of thanks as we're entering into that season. And we try to tell our kids frequently, even though life doesn't go the way we plan it, God still does good things. God still provides. God still blesses us. God still answers our prayers. And we really do try to drill this into the kids because this has been a season of things not going how we plan. But we don't want to forget the good things that God does. So if you want to take one of these home, you can do it as a family, as individuals. We have lots of extras. The kids are going to put up a patchwork quilt of thanks in the hallway in the next couple weeks. So go home, color, tell us what you're thankful for, tell us what God is doing, and we will add it to the wall. So be watching for those to go up. And... I know several of you saw the clipboards. <laughs> if you are feeling led to help with our kids, this is a blessing. This is a privilege. I would like everybody to sign the clipboard. I don't want to chase you down and say, we need teachers. Because we do. We really do need teachers. If we can get at least 10 sign-ups, we can pull this off for the winter quarter. And I'll let you know, there's snow days during winter. There's vacations during winter. You may have a little less kids during winter, so if you're looking to break yourself in, this is the best quarter to do it. Thank you. Pass those clipboards back. Thank you, Lori. Now, these really are my, my notes of what the announcements are to read. I know when I see someone with a cell phone, I feel like, oh, they're just about to level up on the candy crush, and they just don't want to lose the opportunity. Do you guys see me in the same way? It really is the nose. Okay. <laughs> so on Friday, November 12th, from 7 to 9 p.m., we're going to have Euchre Night in the gymnasium. And if you would like to participate, there's a sign-up in the entryway. And uh, bring a snack to share if you can. Next, we have a group that we call Philippians 2. They are looking for some help to prepare and serve Thanksgiving meals for the homeless. So if you are interested in that, contact the church office. And lastly, we will have our annual congregational meeting on November 14th at 1 p.m. November 14th. Everybody's welcome 
to get that congregational report. And now I think we have Pastor Cindy joining us. Please welcome Pastor Cindy. Hello. Are you coming out this way? I will, yeah. Okay. Good morning. How's everybody today? Has it been one of those weeks for you guys? It has been for us. It's a good week. It's a good time to be in church, isn't it? So I am Pastor Cindy. I'm the missions pastor here at the Vineyard. And I would like to extend a welcome to you all, whether you're online or in this building. I'm always happy to see who stops by the Vineyard. So if you would introduce yourself in the entryway or online, drop me a note, a message, or a comment, and I'll check the comments out later, and I'll see the rest of you out in the entry later on where we're all hanging out. Now, it's getting to that season, like Lori was talking about, when our minds turn to Thanksgiving and the holidays, and they turn to traditions and the, um, the kinds of things that we just do this time of year. And I am so thankful for all of you. I'm thankful for the, those of you who thought of me during Pastor Appreciation Month and dropped a card or a gift. I, I'm always overwhelmed. And, um, you know, I thought I would just share a couple of pictures from my vacation that we did um, in September during this beautiful time of year. We took a vacation to Boston by the train. So, uh, well, I guess that one's up there too. Um, gosh, guys, you never know what to expect of me, do you? You guys think that's me? It isn't. And you know why you can tell? There's no gap in the front teeth. <laughs> See, somebody who's my friend will immediately look at, look at that and say, yeah, that looks like her, but it's not her. My daughter actually sent me this picture and said, I thought for sure that was you, Mom, because my husband has preached to my children, never put anything past your mother. <laughs> but when you know a friend, you know them for who they are, and it goes past the skin. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about being a friend of God, being our friend and being a friend to man. So would you please pray with me? Lord God, I thank you for this time and this opportunity to open your word, to talk about who you are. And Jesus, you are so much more than our friend. You are so deep and so wise. And Lord, I ask for you to communicate today. I ask for you to show yourself to this church, to anyone who would seek you, Jesus. I know you will show yourself because it's your promise, and I trust you with that promise. I commit myself to you, and I ask for everyone here. Also, Lord, open their ears to hear everything from you and nothing from me. In Jesus' name, amen. A person that someone enjoys being with, some you li someone you like, that's the Webster definition of a friend. And before we continue, I kind of want to get this straight. It's not about us friending God, because who wouldn't want to friend God, right? You know, it's like, I remember, I'm going to tell you guys some stories today. Is that okay? I'm just going to tell you some stories. It's like I had to get a flute for my daughter. And a friend of mine went to play it, because I have no talent. And she went to play this flute for me. And we walk into the music store, and I saw it online. And I said, this is the price of the flute. And the guy said, no, this is the price of the flute. It was about $100 or more. And we went back and forth, and she played it, and it was fine. And finally, I pull up, you know, this is how much it's supposed to cost. I set the appointment. I came for the flute. This is all I'm going to pay. And he looked at me, and he goes, ma'am, that's right. That's all you're going to pay. Here's the flute. And my friend taps me on the shoulder and says, you know what? He just should have looked at you and said, you see that God standing behind her? You might as well just hand the flute over and count yourself equal. <laughs> because that is the kind of friend God is to us. He takes care of us even in those little times. So this is about God being our friend, not so much as us being a friend to him, although we do want to know him and know what he is. Because he's perfect in every way. He is overwhelming and incredible. He is amazing accuracy in his word to deal with everything that is going in our lives right now, even though the word was written many, many years before. 
His grace is immersible. It is absolutely imperative that we lean ourselves in to who our God is and find out how he is our friend. And not only is God the creator of the universe and we his creation, not the same like or matter, but he desires this friendship with us. He wants to be our friend. The relationship that he desires for us is way more than skin deep. And just like I can look at that picture and say, I know that's not me because it doesn't have a gap in the front teeth because I see the imperfections and my friends will know my imperfections. They still love me. And God still loves us. Throughout the Old Testament, God named, God named a few servants as his friends. Today, we're going to observe traits of how God was a friend to them. Let's start with James 2.23. If you have your Bibles, feel free to open them. If not, it's going to be on the screen behind me. And thank you to Ressie Waddle for getting all those ready. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. God chose not only to share his friendship with Abraham, but with all of his descendants. Now, I don't know if you guys have a family that does that, where you're not just friends with the people that you started with, but you're friends with everybody in their family tree. For example, when I was growing up, I grew up in a very German community. My, my dad was born in 1914. So he was much older than most of your parents would have been. I'm not that old. Don't start trying to add it up. <laughs> and so the people that were his relatives came over in the 1860s. We were friends with the Hanneburgers. The Hanneburgers were from the same village and sat beside my great, 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 whatever, grandfather on the boat from Germany. Just sat beside them. And they talked and met on the boat. Every once a month, every Sunday, because I was the youngest, I was required to come and hear stories of Bavaria and the old country so that I would understand and know where everyone came from. And because I was the youngest and also I had a memory like a steel trap at the time, they asked me to come and to remember the stories. No one wrote them down. It was my responsibility as the youngest child. That's a lot, isn't it? All our descendants are still friends with the Hanneburgers. God required a lot of Abraham. Over and over, Abraham obeyed him and did exactly what God asked him to do. Now, don't get me wrong. I am well aware that Abraham did not follow perfectly. I am well aware that he messed up. But it's those imperfections that God still used and loved. Like all good friends, God remembered the obedient times. Statements like Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness because God gave him righteousness. That should strengthen each and every one of us, not because we messed up, but because God chooses to give us his righteousness. One of the biggest displays of Abraham's obedience, I think everybody goes to, is when God asked him to sacrifice his only and loved son, Isaac. See, Abraham had been promised to be the father of many nations. He promised Abraham's descendants would outnumber the stars, and Isaac was the only son. How could Abraham, or God ask Abraham, to kill his only son? So let's read. Genesis 2, or Genesis 22, 1 and 2. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Okay, just for note, if God ever calls your name, that's the right response. Here I am. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. I bet Abraham couldn't believe what he was hearing, but he knew it was God. He'd heard him before. He knew what he was asking him. And it doesn't matter if you have only one child or you have many. Sacrificing a child, 
that doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem like God was going to ask for that. But Abraham prepared the firewood and set out to do what God asked him to do. I'm sure it was a slow walk. All the time, Abraham must have thought of who God is with each step. He must have talked to Isaac about God's faithfulness and his character. Abraham must have remembered those promises over and over and over again and reminded himself. And when Isaac asked where the sacrifice was, Abraham answered with certainty that God will provide a lamb. Abraham was absolutely certain of God's character and nature. Sure enough, the ram was caught in the thicket by its horns, not because God promised to provide a lamb, but because God promised his descendant, Abraham's descendants, would outnumber the stars in the sky. It was because he promised to have those descendants, Abraham believed, not because of the lamb. God was honored. He was praised. He received glory. And now let's read the blessing. Genesis 22, 15 to 18. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Generation after generation have received blessings from the Lord because of Abraham's faithfulness. Yes, he messed up. He absolutely did. But the Bible says that mankind was was blessed because of him. It says that his descendants were blessed because of him. We are human. We do mess up. And God is a friend who sees those imperfections and loves us anyway. God is faithful and his character never changes. Abraham knew that. He was certain of it. Now this story that I'm going to tell you is nothing close to what Abraham was asked to do. But it does have one parallel. God didn't promise this to me. I just knew God's character. I knew what he was like. When I was um, in college, my sister wanted a cat. She decided she was going to drive back, have me drive her back to our, the nearest big town to us, is, um, uh, Chillicothe. And we were going to go down there and buy this cat. It was $1,000. And my skin just absolutely crawled over. Now, there's good reason if you're a breeder to buy an expensive animal. I get that. Not a problem. Farm girl, understand it. However, for somebody who just wants a little fuzzy cat, $1,000 is a lot of money. And I knew that's all she really wanted was a little fuzzy cat. So I'm driving, and it's about 1030 at night, and it is country dark. You all know that? Country dark. There's no lights. There's nothing. And I'm driving along Egypt Pike in Ross County, and I'm sitting there, and I'm hearing her say, yep, I'm going to get my money out of the bank, and I'm going to go do this. And I'm telling her, all you want is a cat. And she's going, nope, I'm going to do it. So I'm telling Jesus, Jesus, this is a waste of money. I won't have this. I, next time I see a pair of little beady eyes on the side of the road, I'm going to get her a cat. Okay? I don't recommend doing this. So as I'm driving along... I see a pair of little beady eyes. I slam on the brakes, throw the car in park, jump out, jump down into a ditch and reach into weeds that are well over my head, grab this thing, this furry thing that's down in there, pull it out, and it's a little yellow kitten. <laughs> I throw it in the back seat to my sister and say, here, here's your cat. She did not spend $1,000 on a cat, and she loved that kitten. It was something that gave her much pleasure, and that's really what she wanted. God let me know her heart so that I could make her happy, but more than that, I knew God, so I could act with certainty 
that the thing I was grabbing in that ditch in the dark of night was going to be a kitten. It wasn't a cat. It wasn't a possum. It wasn't, and, and it was, there were no other cats or kittens. The next day I called the farms that were nearby and asked if they'd had kittens. None of them had. There was just a kitten stuck in the weeds. When Jesus came, he came out of God's desire to be a friend. He was a friend to all the world, wasn't he? And still is. He desires for all people to know him. And like Abraham and the others who were called friends of God, we can still trust him today that he is our friend. In John 15, 13 to 15, it says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down his life for one's friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. We can now be called friends of God by receiving Jesus as our Savior and Lord. Jesus laid down his life to allow this to happen. We don't have to be a spiritual giant or a hero like Abraham or Job or David and even Moses who spoke with the Lord as the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to his friend. God can speak to us today in our hearts in a very real and very practical ways. Now I'm going to share a couple of quick stories and hopefully they won't go too long and make you bored. But these are, these are stories that I hope encourage you. One was when um, my mom always had trouble with her blood pressure and one day I got a call that she had had a stroke. It was a massive stroke and we knew she was in deep trouble. So I took a moment on my way there and I prayed and I said, Lord, what am I to do? And he said, your mom will survive this. Be her advocate, fight for her that she can get back home again. I said, okay. So that's what I did. Now my mom was paralyzed, but we took care of her for 10 years and she couldn't walk, but she had a good life for those 10 years. And in the meantime, my dad got sick, also had a stroke. And when he, um, when he had the stroke, I was with him. And I had to wait an hour and 45 minutes on the squad to show up. It's a long time. So in that time, I went back to the Lord and I said, Lord, what's going to happen? What's going on? What should I do? And he said, I'm going to take him on Monday. It was a Friday. On Monday, my dad died. Now, the thing I know is the Lord knew. He was with me and he comforted me. He was with me and he showed me. I knew that was all within God's grace and within his mercy. And then whenever my mom finally, when she passed, um, she'd had many trips to the hospital, as you can imagine. When she passed, we went into the hospital and she had had... Um, some breathing issues. She was cyanotic, and they told us that she was going to be gone soon. So I went and I prayed, and I asked the Lord if he would withhold taking her for a while, and he responded back, better is one day in my house. And I said, I know, Lord. I know better is one day, but I'm asking so my sister will come to heaven. She won't receive the Lord if you, she won't receive you if you take mom now. And I know that. So will you please withhold for a time so that she can come to you. Within 20 minutes, my mom was pink and breathing on her own because the Lord turned it around like that. Then when we came time for my mother to go, my sister did pray to receive Christ. A friend of mine came and shared the Lord and instantly she crumbled and prayed to receive Christ. He was not in the room 10 minutes. When my mom finally died the night before, or maybe a couple of days before. I was sitting in her room, and I uh, always sat on the floor then. Leaned up against the wall, reading a book, and just there to take care of her, whatever she needed. And 
the, uh, the Lord came to me and said, um, don't, don't be afraid. And all the alarms started going off in the hospital. Somebody was in code blue. It was not my mom. It was somebody else. And as I'm sitting there, I'm going, how should I pray, Lord? And he said, I'm doing this right now so you can see. These are the people who will be on duty when your mom dies. This is what it's going to look like. This is how it's going to sound. And I don't want you to worry or be afraid. So I want you to see it. But I'm coming to you to let you know that this is what it's, what's going to happen. And within 24 hours or very shortly, my mother passed. That's the kind of love the father brings. He did not take my parents, but he gave me peace. He gave me confidence that he was with me. And those are the things that a friend does. Now, a few years ago, um, about eight now, I had a similar health issue where I was in the hospital and I uh, I'd had awful pain in my abdomen. The doctors came in the ER and said, um, Mrs. Taylor, you have uh, metastatic cancer. Leonard was absolutely slid down the corner in the ER and was just absolutely overwhelmed. And being the person I am, I'm looking at them going, would you kindly tell me why you came in and said those words to me? And they're going, what? So I, uh, I asked them what they saw and what, they, what made them think that. So they had to go over and tell me everything that they saw. And I said, well, I, I don't believe that. I'm going to just kind of hold out here and see what's going on. And I'm going on the way to the room there. I was at the James. On the way over, they're wheeling me over, and I'm going, oh, God, I, I hear what they're saying. I know who you are. I know how you've healed cancer before. I know how you act. I'm just, I'm trusting you, but honest, I'm a little scared. I'm a little scared here. And I said, would, would it be okay if I could run into my friend Mike? Mike works in the hospital, I think. I don't think he's retired. Maybe he has. Haven't seen him in years. Could it be? So I got up to the room. It was late at night. I'd been in there almost 12 hours waiting to get seen. When I finally got into my room, it was only a couple of hours till the morning shift came on. You know who walked through that door? My friend Mike. He walks in and he goes, I'm going to be your uh, patient assistant today. I've been assigned to you. God didn't let him just run into me in the hallway. He assigned him to me of all the people who work at OSU in the hospital of all the shifts. He was assigned to me. And then I'm sitting there and I'm going, okay, God, thank you so much. And I said, by the way, Mike, I prayed that you would be here. Thanks for coming. And Mike's still standing there going, what are you doing here? And I explained it to him. So I'm laying in my bed and all the doctors are coming in because at OSU it's a teaching hospital. You get lots of doctors. And you, as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, you know what, God? I have taken this gun off my hip and fired it so many times and seen you heal so many people of cancer. Can I just do that this time and just watch it go? And God said, nope, the gun's not there for you. You have to rely on the prayers of other people. You cannot do this. It has got to be the prayers of everyone else. So I asked everybody and their cousin in the grocery line, pray for me. I don't know who it is, but somebody needs to pray for me. So went back in. They took out a little chunk of my lung. It was not pleasant, very painful. I did not handle it well. I was not brave. I was not a hero. I, was, I cried all the time. I was a mess. I still trusted God, but it was the things that man would do to me before I got to heaven I was worried about. And the, um, the thing was, in all of this, was when they opened me up for the second surgery in 
actually it was the third within a month, they were sure. The doctor said he was 98% sure that I was going to be full of cancer. Two doctors went through everything in my abdomen. They could not find cancer anywhere. That's what God does. Not to my glory, but to God's. Not to my glory, but to God's. A personal relationship with God is because he wanted it. He didn't have to come. And when people would ask me, how can I pray for you? I would tell them, pray that I'm healed. And they would say, but what if you're not healed? I said, then pray that I suffer well. And they look at me going, really? Yeah, really. Because that's what God's called me to. Either healing or suffering well. Now, he wants these relationships and he wants us to come of our own free will. He wants us to love him. And no one can be forced to be a Christian. Jesus paid the price so that we can have relationship. God wanted that relationship back in the garden, but sin severed it. So he, there was not that relationship for many, many years. But then it says in John 19, 41 to 42, now there was a garden in the place where Jesus was crucified. And in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. And because it was the Jewish day of preparation, the tomb was nearby and they placed Jesus there. He wanted relationship with man in a garden. And there Jesus was crucified and paid the only price that could allow for that to happen. Think that's just a coincidence? I believe it was God. He desires us. And he desires to, uh, us to have that relationship with him now and not just as fire insurance so we don't end up in hell. Friends, I know many of you looked at that picture and said, no, nah, that's not her. Some of you probably did because you don't know me as well. Take me to lunch. <laughs> and even though that person looks like me, it isn't consistent with who I am. You guys know me beyond my skin. And God already knows each and every one of us full well. He knows everything seen and unseen. And my challenge to you today is to know him full well to learn about him, to understand his character and his nature, to read the word of God in such a way that you are learning about him and who he is and let him know that you trust him. Trust him. Will you agree with him for what his will is, even if it isn't what you want? Will you agree with him even if it hurts? and give him glory? And can you weep and still give God glory and honor him? Because he is a friend beyond all else. And he will give you strength. And with that, I would like to ask the team to come back up. Friends, would you stand please and let me pray for you? Lord God, I ask for your spirit to hover over us, for us to embrace you, for us to be excited about what you do and how you do it. Lord, I ask for you to speak, for your voice to be in the ears of those who are willing to hear you. And I ask, Lord, for us to trust you, for us to turn our hearts to you in every way and hold nothing back, Lord, because you are worthy. Let us give you glory now by praise and let us give you glory with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
this first song is uh, as we move into this time of ministry is really um, a confirmation of um, who Jesus is. If at any point during the uh, ministry you'd like to come for prayer, maybe you're looking for some kind of healing, some kind of comfort, maybe you're longing to get some, uh, some sense that God is with you. And I think most of us have those times where we just really, we're in this place where, yeah, there may be people around and they're, and they're trying to encourage and those kind of things, but we still feel uh, kind of still alone. I believe God wants to fill that gap, and I think that's really the heart of what uh, Cindy was saying today. So, Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come now. Come. If you'd like prayer for anything. I want to invite you to come on up and some folks get around you.
feel like the Lord really wants to just move that a little bit closer. And I realize some of the kingdom stories Cindy was sharing with you may seem just like almost impossible for most, but it is the part of the Father. Sometimes it comes just in those moments of desperation. When we know that there's no place else we can go, no one else we can call on, that we experience His presence with us. You need the presence of the Lord in some greater way. Maybe you just want to experience Him. This is a great song just to express it. Don't discount what He might do.
announce that you are more than a friend, Lord, you're more than a savior, Lord, you're more than God, you're more, Lord, than our words can ever say. Lord, we are so in love with you, so thankful for all that you do. And God, I just feel like this morning there are still some, Lord, who just need a little, a little something extra in the way of hope. Lord, would you let your Holy Spirit just sweep over them right now? Maybe, Lord, they've heard from a physician uh, something, Lord, that they can't shake and that's become their focus. That diagnosis, Lord. Right now, Lord, I pray in the name of Christ Jesus, Lord, their hearts and their minds turn to you, Lord. They may not change the validity of what's happening within them, Lord, but it sure changes the hope that we have. Lord, we are not stuck in this place, Lord. Our hope is in you. And God, I pray that you will just encourage those who are brokenhearted. I pray you will heal those who need healed. Lord, just come in some greater way in each of our lives and just help us, Lord, to realize how close you are. Lord. So close, Lord, that we can, should we choose, place our hand in yours. Lord, every tomorrow, Lord, we'll walk with you, one who sticks closer than a brother, one who calls us friend. Father, we love you, we bless you, we give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day.